So in this case, we've got an interesting case. We have a gentleman who's in his middle 30s. Uh, he presented with <clears throat> a tooth that was causing him some pain. Uh, tooth number eight, you can see it looked like he had a little bit of a periapical abscess. He reported that he had had some trauma when he was young, uh, more than once. Um, you know, boys will be boys, probably wrestling or playing football or doing any number of things that boys generally do that sometimes isn't the smartest. So we identified PA abscess here, obviously some composite repair, also a large internal resorptive lesion. So I referred him to a root canal specialist for evaluation and possible treatment. You'll notice the um, canal in tooth number eight is fairly obliterated. It looks like it's not very much there anymore. Um, and obviously this uh, internal resorptive lesion um, would be difficult to manage. Um, so the endodontist talked him through choices, options, alternatives, um, and they ended up discussing, you know, eliminating the teeth and replacing them with the dental implants would probably be the best choice. So um, I re referred him after having a conversation, a follow-up conversation with him um, to my oral surgeon. Uh, the oral surgeon went ahead and took the teeth out and placed a couple of dental implants at the same time. So oftentimes, and I'm sure you know this, we like to try to place the implants after an appropriate period of healing um, with a bone graft to make sure that the bone is stable enough um, to heal. Now, in this case, it ended up working out really, really well. He was able to place the dental implants at the same time and felt confident in their outcome, um, long-term outcome potential, I should say. Um, you'll notice that the implants are not at exactly the same height. Um, you know, tooth number eight is just ever so slightly more incisal than um, number nine. Um, so the design process, you'll see that as we go through the design process, there's a little bit of compensation that we had to do. Um, but there's the immediate post-placement. Here is the, I wanna say this is a four month follow-up x-ray, a panoramic. You can see obviously they've done the second stage and they've placed the um, healing abutments in there. So um, the next step was to restore it. Um, as you'll see later on in the video, um, the design process, I used tie bases and scanned. Um, and then the next step was placing the custom abutments in place. So these are Emax custom abutments on titanium bases, tie base. And this is a Nobel active internal conical connection with a regular platform. These are 4.3 millimeter wide implants. Um, I want to say they're 11 or 13 millimeters long. Um, and so this is an NBA 5.0L tie base. Both of these are NBA 5.0L tie base. So the NBA 5.0L tie base goes on, will fit on either the 4.3 millimeter dental implant, Nobel active internal conical connection implant, or the 5.0 implant. So the 5.0 tie base fits on the 5.0 or the 4.3 millimeter implant. Um, when you get to a 3.5, implant, uh, the implant platform is 3.5 millimeters, then you need a 4.5 millimeter tie base. It gets really confusing and I'm not sure why they've broken it out that way. Um, the narrow platform dental implant requires a 4.5 millimeter tie base. The regular platform implant requires a 5.0 um, NBA 5.0. So here's the um, pre-seat crown x-ray before we put the crowns in. Um, I packed some um, Teflon, uh, Teflon tape, you know, plumber's tape um, up into the extraction spots or the uh, uh, access holes um, before uh, cementing the crowns. And I cemented them with um, a very link aesthetic. And you'll notice it looks like we got a little bubble here when the assistant filled the crowns. We have a little bubble of um, air in that crown. So I'm going to monitor that very closely. If there's any color change, um, we will replace that crown for him. Um, I don't think there will be. It's an LT Emax. The, the blocks are, are LT. So I don't think anything will show through, but if there is any color change or if he wants to replace it for any reason, then I'll do that for him. It's no problem. Um, I, you know, I think we'd have to cut the crown off, is, which is why I'm saying that. There's no way to retrieve that crown without destroying the crown. And I'd rather destroy the crown than destroy the abutment and the crown. <laughs> so that's the post-op, um, the final x-ray. I didn't take any intraoral photos. Honestly, the shade was not ideal in my opinion. Um, he has about an A3 shade on his adjacent natural teeth. Um, this particular, um, these crowns were A2, um, and he intentionally chose them to be a little bit lighter 
Um, I wasn't real happy, but he was very happy with it. Um, and, and as I always tell my patients, you know, if you need to change the color within the next year, I'm happy to do that for you. We just need some advance notice and you need to work with our schedule. Um, but that was it. So going forward, you'll see the design process. Um, it's a pretty interesting case, you know, fairly complicated. The design of the tie base um, restorations can be a little bit complex. Um, but when you follow each of the steps and do the steps that you should be doing, it shouldn't be that much more complicated than designing an anterior crown, in this case, an anterior tie base crown. Um, the posterior crowns, where we can do the hybrid abutment crowns that are, are a single piece, tend to be very simple, very straightforward. You just have to manage that tissue contour um, to make sure that the outcome is good. So when he comes in for follow-up, I'll try to add, uh, take a couple of post-op photos of the tissue. Um, it looked really, really good on the lingual, though, because this one is slightly higher. Um, you can see there was a little bit of a depression. Um, you know, the, the palatal tissue is nice and tight. And then there was a little bit of a depression right there where the abutment meets the gum tissue instead of a really nice, just because of the positioning of uh, where this emergence profile was, um, I couldn't get a really solid connection just because of how high that um, implant uh, surgical platform was. So anyway, great case, lots of fun. Um, enjoy. Okay, everybody, welcome. Um, today we're going to work on restoring these two upper implants. These are both Nobel Active um, internal conical connection regular platform. You can see the color coding. These are both uh, the yellow or gold color coding. I took an impression because we didn't have the tie bases um, on hand, otherwise I would have done these um, all in one appointment. Generally I like to try to do that. Um, anyway, so this is, uh, uh, these are the tie bases I should say. They're both, like I said, Nobel um, regular platform, um, Nobel active internal conical connection dental implants. So what we've got here is the uh, impression copings, um, implant analogs, let me just take these impression copings off and you can see my little soft tissue model there. All right. Sometimes when you make these little soft tissue models out of uh, PVS, they end up creating a little bit of a challenge to get them to go back into place exactly the same way. Um, but they do create a, a helpful guide when we're designing restorations. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and get your uh, tie bases placed. That one looks like it's going to open easier there. So you can see we have the tie base itself uh, and the screw. And this is the regular platform uh, internal conical connection, Nobel Active. I know I've said that three or four times already. Um, this particular tie base. Uh, we'll work with the 5.0 Nobel Active and also the 4.3. So we're just going to place these. Let's see. I want to be careful about where I place my sprue uh, because I want, or rather where I place the, the notch. You can see the notch right there on the top of the tie base because the sprue generally is rotated 90 degrees from um, the notch. So I'm going to intentionally orient this one so that that notch is going to the distal, which will place the sprue, let me get that to engage, there we go, on the lingual. All right. So you can see if I pull this out of the way, there's the notch on the distal, which means that sprue, when it's milled, will be coming out this direction. Okay, let's open the other box. Same size tie base. These are tough to open, so I usually end up just cutting through the labeling. They like to resist opening. So same thing here, a regular platform, Nobel, um, internal conical connection. Just going to place that 
screw inside. Now with this one, um, I'm going to intentionally place, this is tooth number eight now, I'm going to place the notch and the groove uh, to the mesial. And the rationale behind that is I want that sprue to be rotated or to be positioned once we're um, done designing. I want that to be positioned to the lingual, where the highest, tallest height of that um, custom abutment that I'm going to make will be. Let's see if I can get this to engage. There we go. Sometimes you got to work them a little bit to get the hex to slide into place. Um, generally, we like to take a radiograph at this point to ensure if it's in the patient's mouth that they're seated correctly. And these two are, I know that the one on the right, tooth number eight, um, was seated a little less deeply, a little shallower, um, relatively speaking, um, shallower than the other one. So these are fine. Um, so the next step is to put on some scan caps. Double check these. These are just finger tight. I haven't torqued them down or anything. Good placement by my periodontist. Okay, so here we have a couple of uh, scan caps. Now remember that there is a notch on the scan cap and there's a groove inside. You see that groove? Now that groove lines up with um, the, the notch on the tie base itself. Now remember we position these intentionally uh, to accommodate the sprue positioning. So on tooth number eight, you kind of see that past the gingival tissue. Um, that groove is toward, sorry, that's number nine, toward the distal. Now I can, I got other videos that demonstrate this, but I could, if I wanted to, misalign this and force it to place. You can see that notch in there. Um, but if I gently seat it with my finger, and this is not something you can always do in a patient's mouth, you can feel when it lines up, and then it should slide down without too much difficulty. If you're getting a lot of resistance, then it's probably misaligned. And you'll notice the triangle, the little pyramid on the top of this, the longer end, which is up here on the top, is pointing toward that notch, that groove. It's not a perfect um, equilateral triangle. So let's put our other one in. So these should be facing generally in the same direction. You can see that one, that notch is not exactly to the mesial, but that will create a sprue that's coming off this direction where my fingernail is. All right, so I'm just gonna line this up. Let's get that camera to focus. So see how it's, it's not lined up there? I could force that to place, and since this is plastic, it would mold, it would bend, it would deform, and it would fit. But if I gently set it on there and twist until I feel it, you can actually feel it drop in there. Um, they do engage a little bit, so you want to be cautious. You have to put a little bit of pressure, but I can actually feel it drop into place. And then gently seat it. It should not require a lot of force. Okay? Now these things you usually can't see on an x-ray unless you turn your exposure settings way down. Um, so normally it's up to you to visually, to visually visualize that they're seated all the way. Um, so at this point, we're going to go ahead and uh, scan, and I do want to make sure when I do the scanning with the Omnicam that this tissue is in the right place. So probably what I'll do, since it's a little deformed up here, is I'll trim off some of the underside to make sure it seats all the way, because I don't want a misrepresentation of what his mouth actually looks like. Um, so we're going to go ahead and scan it, and we're going to take three images. Uh, well, four images, I guess. An upper, a lower, a bite, and the tie base scan. Um, some people, you can actually use uh, the upper, in this case, and the tie base as the same image. You can copy it and move it, or copy it over to the other image set. But generally, when you've got um, some soft tissue that we're working on, you want to make sure that you have a really solid, um, separate image that shows the soft tissue so you can toggle it on and off during the design phase. Now, bear in mind that when we're designing um, anterior crowns in particular, we want to intentionally create a very nice emergence profile at the expense 
of the tissue that's currently in place within reason. Um, because we want to mold intentionally the tissue. Now, sometimes that tissue molding requires some tissue training with a temporary um, PMMA or acrylic or some sort of a, an abutment. Um, but I would rather create an ideal emergence profile that yields a long-term healthy gingival um, outcome than create um, you know, an anemic one. Hello, welcome back. Um, so let's go ahead and set this case up. We have two anterior implant crowns that we're working on, number eight and number nine. You'll notice here that uh, the computer is defaulted um, to what we use most commonly, which is a, a bi auto detect biogeneric individual Emax crown. So I'm gonna change that uh, to an implant restoration. Um, I always set them up as multi-abutment, uh, multi-layer abutment crowns. It seems to be easier. You can you can certainly go back and forth and change them as your, your design is set up that way. Um, but I usually set them up this way, and if I opt to split it later on in the process, that's fine. Um, these are going to be biogeneric individual crowns. Now the framework material, I'm going to use Emacs, which is an Ivoclar product, um, and the tie base. So you can see here we've got Emacs as the veneering structure and the, the framework material. It automatically defaults to that for me. Um, here's my milling device. The tie base we're going to use is a Densupply Serona tie base. And these are Nobel Active, not Nobel Replace Select. We're going to scroll all the way down to the bottom of this list. Nobel Active, the 5.0 is the size that you'd use for a regular platform, the gold or the yellow. And then we're using tie bases, not scan posts. Scan posts for a lot of people are easier to use. They're a little bit taller. The tie bases are shorter. And if you've got a deep implant, the tie bases can be difficult to negotiate getting them all the way in um, and being able to see that groove and notch that we talked about a minute ago. So we've got all these set up. So I'm just going to click the two teeth we're working on, number eight, number nine. Um, just verify everything over here is correct. And we can go over to the next step. This is the scanning step. All right, now I'm going to go ahead and grab my face and move it up here so it's out of the view a little bit. And then let's go ahead and do some scanning. <clears throat> so here is, you know, the piece that we put together. You'll notice down on the bottom of the screen here we have four different categories we need to fill in. There's the upper jaw and there's the scan body upper jaw. So for a lot of dentists, we'll actually take out these tie bases or before we put the tie bases in, go ahead and scan, right? Um, but for me, I've already put them in there, so I'm just going to use this as my upper jaw and my um, scan body upper. Okay, so here's the camera, all right? Let me wipe off some of that disinfectant there. Um, positioning wise, you know, generally if this is a patient in the mouth, they'll be laying, you know, roughly in this, in this orientation, so I like to try to use a fulcrum here. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and just start scanning. You'll hear the clicking there. And I like to tell my patients that that clicking is not a Geiger counter. There's no radiation involved. Um, but that each of those clicks is a photo. And basically this is a, a video camera. Um, I've learned through the years that less is more when we're scanning. Now that comes with some warnings. You always want to make sure you have a very solid imaging set of the tie bases in particular in the area that you're restoring. Um, but everything else you can you can literally, not literally, but you can skip some of that. Let's turn that off so it doesn't click so much. So here's our image set of that upper. We've got a little bit of extrapolation right in these areas. Um, I've got Canine to canine, which is great. Um, okay, so I don't feel the need to create a separate scan set. So I'm going to grab this. I'm going to drag it over. I'm going to release the button, and I'm going to hit copy. So now the computer is replicating that image set over there. And you can see we have the green check, so we're good to go. All right, you could certainly go in and create a separate image set before you put the tie bases in and the scan bodies, and that's totally fine. Um, I didn't do that here. Okay, so here's our lower arch. And again, the only reason I did, um, did it using this technique is we didn't have the tie bases 
um, in the office, and so we had to take impressions. We had used them on a previous patient. So I'm going to go ahead and scan the lower arch, and I'm only going to scan what I need. I'm not going to scan the entire lower arch. And I think most of you will agree with me, but when you scan a stone model, it tends to scan a lot easier than teeth. Um, probably because it's dry and there's not as much saliva and all that stuff, right? So that's plenty. We got a little bit of extraneous imaging there. Um, when we go down to the next image set, the buckle, and I'm just going to hand articulate these. They articulate really stably. Um, I do have a, a, a blue bite, a blue moose bite that we took, but these articulate very, very sta in a very stable manner. Um, and you can also see, if I can get it lined up there, that uh, there's no impingement on those tie bases. So um, there's, this should work just fine. Um, make sure they orient real tightly and there's no shifting. And then I'm going to take that buckle scan. And I like to kind of sweep up and down. And you can see the computer has already pulled the modeling in. All right. Turn that camera off. Okay, so that's the scanning. Now you'll notice that scanning, granted these are models, you'll notice that scanning took five minutes, maybe? Um, in the mouth it should take the same. Um, if you're spending too much time, time scanning, you're spending, um, number one, too much of your uh, computer memory. Um, it's going to make it more difficult for you to save cases, multiple cases down the road, and it's also going to take a lot longer to um, design. So. Um, next step, we're going to move on to the design phase, and this is the part that will take us a little while, uh, so bear with me. Um, the designing of anterior implant crowns can be, can be challenging um, and a little bit time-consuming, comparatively speaking, but uh, it should be, should be good, so let's move forward. Okay, let's get to the design process. I um, hope you don't mind I'm looking this direction so I can see the CEREC screen a little bit better. Um, so here's what we're doing. Um, first step is to go ahead and position these where they should ref uh, reflect the position of what the, the mouth is in. Um, ideally line these up. I like to put the uh, incisal edge right along this line here just to make sure that it uh, reflects the actual position of the mouth. You can see I have really clear images. Um, let me move this plane up just a smidge. Okay, so next step, once it applies the model axis, is to go ahead and trim the area. So right now it's selected tooth number nine. I'm going to unselect tooth number eight. Um, I like to do the pancake technique or the real narrow cutout technique just so I only isolate the tie base itself. Um, double click. There we go. And then I'm going to select tooth number nine, and we're going to do the same thing. You can see we got a little bit of weird imaging right there. Double click to start. Narrowly trim the tie bases out. Okay. Next step is to click the scan body heads. Now this is where it becomes absolutely critical that we have high quality images of these pyramids on the top of the scan bodies. So it's right now it's on tooth number nine. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in really far and I want to just get a really clear image of where that tip is. Let's see, that looks good. Now let's do number eight. Okay, that looks good. Um, edit the baseline. Um, let's see what our baseline is. I'm going to skip those for now. All right, defining restoration axis. So this is where we will determine exactly the, the axis of the tooth, um, ignoring the axis of the implant. Now you can see this one's red right here because the line of uh, the path of insertion of the implant screw is actually coming out the facial of that tooth. So using this little joystick, I'm going to lean these forward, and it also helps sometimes to turn on the lower arch so you can see where those teeth should be. So this is, again, determining path of insertion. And you notice that both of these teeth are locked together, um, which is nice when we're doing multiple restorations. 
adjacent to each other. And let me go just a little bit more to the facial. That's pretty good. I don't want them to have buck teeth. Uh, let me pull them back just a little bit lingually. Okay. So you can see, you can probably surmise at this point, there's no way without an angled screw, which I'm not going to use, um, that we're going to be able to get um, um, those, those screw access channels uh, through uh, the lingual surface of the tooth. It'll come right out the incisal. So Novell has those great screw screws that can go, I want to say it's 25 degrees. Um, I don't really have any experience using those. It'd be worth looking into. It's something that hopefully I'll be able to get some experience looking into, but I just don't have any experience with those yet. So we're going to define that restoration axis right here. Go to the next step. And now it should give us a couple of proposals. Um, now my experience in previous versions of the software 4.3, even all the way back to whenever it was we first saw dental implants, is oftentimes you get a really wonky, weird proposal. Um, so it's helpful to know all the tools that you have, uh, resources and tools that you have. So yeah, those don't look right to me. Um, so a couple of things that we can do. I'm going to go to positioning. I'm going to change the position using um, the bio jaw feature. I'm going to hit OK. Um, and I always turn this off. I hate that button. I want these teeth to be what I want them to be, not what the computer wants them to be for now. I'm going to turn back on the lower jaw. And you can see if we were to keep this positioning right now, this would generally work pretty darn well. Um, so that constrained adaption, ad, 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 adoption um, will basically alter the tooth so it more closely parallels the computer's recommendation rather than yours. So I will leave mine deselected because I want the computer to leave the position of the teeth alone. Um, let's get these positioned a little more favorably. I'm going to go to scale. And what I'm going to do is just close these spaces a little bit. It's something that I can fix later on. Let's pull this one back just a little bit. There we go. Okay, so I've deselected this. I'm going to go ahead and hit the um, calculate, and it's going to recalculate those. And hopefully we'll get a little better proposals than we got just a minute ago. Not so much. Yep, not so much. So we got our work cut out for us. Um, so let's do this. Turn everything off. I'm going to go ahead and blend all these rough edges, smooth all these down. And then I'm going to go ahead and just build this out. For whatever reason, the computer really wants to create necks on these crowns, which is not what I want to see. Yeah? She takes K-Flex one hour before each demo visit, four of them. What's the dose? 100. 100? I don't think k -flex comes in hundreds. Listen, this is what they got off the phone with. I can't be responsible for this. I'm a messenger. <laughs> Gosh, dang it. <laughs> yeah. We just waited so long for the lady to hear that. Uh, yeah, k -flex doesn't come in hundreds. Nothing is here. Okay, it'll be a little bit. That's okay. This doesn't even come in hundreds. It comes in two fifties. Yeah, it doesn't come in hundreds. And you can't even buy it in hundreds. So do we have two hundred and fifty milligrams Keflex in the back? <laughs> okay, if we have two fifties, give her four of those. Two four, two fifty? Uh-huh. Okay, so let's see if we can repair um, this initial proposal. Um, get a decent proposal here. Got 
got some wonky outlines here that this computer has proposed for us. Now you'll notice I'm kind of ignoring, well I'm, I'm not kind of, I'm absolutely ignoring the gingival emergence profile. Um, I want the gingiva to intentionally shape Okay, give me a few minutes. I'll be out in a few minutes. So we want the gingiva to be shaped by the crown, um, not the other way around. I don't want the crown to accommodate the gums. I want the gums to be trained by the crown. Now we can certainly do that any number of ways. You know, I could um, put in a temporary, you know, a PMMA or a telio block um, or something acrylic that would train the gums and then come back in and then take an impression and design that based on the gum profile after the training. Or um, I can design the crowns. Uh, to train the gums now. Um, realizing I may need to contour just a little bit afterwards. Okay, so we're getting a little bit more normal looking. Um, I'm going to use my circular shape tool a little bit more. And chances are really good um, if I design this pressure appropriately we can actually have the gums pressed into that, without strangulating them, pressed into that dark little triangle we're seeing down there along the gingival line. So, um, oftentimes when we're doing this, I'll make sure that I prepare my patients for the fact that you may need to be numbed when we're delivering these crowns. Um, there's a very real chance that this could hurt. If it does, I want to know. We'll get you numb. Um, because we're going to be intentionally sculpting that gum tissue with uh, the crowns, which requires pressure to do that. Okay, I'm going to save. I like to periodically save as we're going through the design process just to make sure. Just to make sure. And then I have a patient waiting on me and a doctor who wants to come shadow just a little bit. So, give me just a moment and we'll get, get this design finished. All right, so line angles, you'll find oftentimes the CEREC machine, the line angles are way too rounded. Okay, so right now we've got way too much contact up that contact, uh, the interproximal contact. Too much red, too much red. Nothing on the distal, let's create a contact back there. I like to start with a little bit of yellow. That's what I like to do. We're going to pull that back a little there. I'll pull the rest back on the other tooth. Yellow is about the extent of what I want contact wise. And I apologize if my voice sounds a little bit out of sorts. We have the flu at my house. And so I've been up and down and up and down all night with kiddos and I think I have a little bit of it myself. Okay, so one thing to bear in mind is the design process isn't finished here on the screen. It's finished when you put it in the mouth. So we've got plenty of other options or opportunities to do some fine tuning 
from the standpoint of post mill processing. Okay, let me save, then I'm going to group, I'm going to do a little incisal variation, and then I do want to alter these um, line angles just a little bit more. You can see how much pressure we've got internally there on the gingiva. That could create some, I mean a lot of pressure, could create some pain for them. So let me just pull that back just a smidge. So this gentleman has actually been walking around without teeth. We made him a flipper, a real nice flipper, um, but he didn't really like it. So he's been walking around without teeth for a while. Um, so we're going to do our best to make it perfect for him, but I don't think he's going to be really exacting in how things turn out. I think he'll be happy with just about anything, um, but I want it to look perfect. I want him to be like we talked about before, a little walking billboard in a good way. Not a bad billboard, a good billboard for our practice. Okay, let's group these and then we're going to do some incisal variation. Where is my variation tool? Hmm, maybe it's not an option anymore. Interesting, okay. Never mind, we'll ungroup it. All right, let's go ahead and split. That margin line is in the wrong place. I want that to be lower, especially on the facial. It needs to be invisible. Let's turn that back on. Still too high. Then we can actually bring this up on the lingual. I like to bring them high on the lingual, not only for the um, sprue, you know, but also for the um, cleansability. Okay, we'll get that one split. It's creating the modeling now. good let's go to number nine let's separate this one this gets a little bit tedious um, but only because we are shooting for excellence and we want to make sure that the outcome is perfect there's certainly some ways you can cut corners Puzzle is going to end up still a little too incisal. So once the um, machine kicks out the restorations, then I'm going to do some incisal variation on my own. Let's see, do we have minimal thickness? Good. Okay, we're going to apply that now. And then I'm going to turn off the upper arch. I got some thin spots. I'll have to trim the tie base just a little bit, but that should yield a really nice outcome. Facial coverage is good. There's our crown. 
Oh, we got cut throughs. You can see the, the cut throughs here, so I gotta go back and edit. Let's see about here. Yep, we're gonna be super thin there too, so I need to bulk these back out. Um, let's bulk this out. And go to the anatomic shape tool, bulk that out. And now we're gonna start running into contact um, challenges. So you've got Emacs to Emacs. We're bonding Emacs to Emacs. And let me just see what our parameter settings are. Sometimes these parameters are set way high. Okay, minimal thickness. So yeah, we're at 0.7, so we're fine. We are fine on the minimal thickness. So, I'm going to do just a little bit of adding, a couple of spots. I'm realizing it's going to be thin, but we're bonding Emacs to Emacs. Um, we are going to have to do a little bit of, come on now, why are we calculating? Not sure why we're calculating. Alright, come on now. Sometimes you have to encourage the computer program. Because I did some editing, it rec recalculates the veneering structure. Okay. All right, let's get these loaded and designed, or loaded and milling. Thanks for putting up with me. This has been a long video. Um, enjoy. Yeah, these, these are challenging, but as long as you've got some experience and can manage the t technical nuance, uh, you usually turn out to be just fine. Alright, so it's gone, it's gone ahead and adjusted our milling um, abutment position so the sprues can now be in a different place than we thought it was going to be. Hopefully that won't create some challenges. Let's see. Okay, that's a favorable position there. Alright, I'm going to get these milling and I'm going to mill these out of the MO blocks, the little white MO blocks. Um, or the medium opacity, they're really white, bright white blocks. So, thanks for watching.